we're working to become much more energy efficient. And then we're producing products that help society become much more energy efficient. Let me give you examples on both sides. As a company, we recognize the, uh, the value of energy efficiency back when the company was founded before the turn of the last century. Um, our, our founder, uh, Mr. Dow, actually worked with Mr. Westinghouse to develop cogeneration, combined heat and power back in the early part of the 1900s. And we've just built upon that. In 1994, though, we put a little more emphasis on it, and we actually set a goal that we would, in the years between 1995 and 2005, we would reduce our energy efficiency, uh, or improve our energy efficiency by 25%, reduce the amount of energy we use to make a, a ton of product by 20, 20%. Um, we far exceeded that target. In fact, when you take the years 1990 to 2005, we cut our energy usage by 38%, saving 1.7 trillion BTUs of energy, or 1.7 quads of energy, sorry, that we've saved. And that's an incredible amount of energy. And then we further pushed ourselves to lower that number by 25% more by the year 2015, and we're on target to do that. So from an industrial energy efficiency, we're setting a real good example. Um, as part of that, we have reduced our own uh, carbon footprint by 22%. Our absolute CO2 emissions have reduced by 22% in that time frame. So it's a real success story. Now, with, in terms of society, what are we doing? You know, chemistry is part of all manufacturing. 97% of all manufactured goods have chemistry in them. So energy efficient, energy efficient products require chemistry. So example, home insulation. Home insulation, we've done some studies that show our own home insulation. Um, for every one ton of CO2 that we emit to make that insulation, uh, society can save seven tons. So if you will, we're making an investment in, in CO2, and then we're helping society make incredible strides in, in, in uh, their own footprint. And we've got other examples. We're helping with carbon capture and storage. We're helping with light weighting of automobiles through our materials. So it's really a two-sided street, and we're being very successful on both sides. And again, we are uh, the beginning of material sciences, producing those things. We're the home of innovation. Um, a lot of the innovations that we see today come out of the chemical industry because that's the building blocks of, of everything we have today. So we consider ourselves a vital part of that. We, we're part of the debate, and, we're, and more importantly, we're part of the solution, and helping people uncover solutions and listening to people and understanding what they need because to be successful in the battle on climate change, we have to be successful in the environmental side of things, but we often have to be successful in the economic side of things. And people tend to forget that balance. Um, if, we, if we tackle climate change at the expense of economics, that, that's not a win. So we're here to help us win on both of those areas. Back in 1995, when we first put this heavy emphasis on energy efficiency, climate change wasn't much discussed at that point. Um, CO2 concerns, we, we weren't even talking about our CO2 emissions at that time. Um, it was strictly a business proposition. The leaders of our company at that time said we need to do better at energy efficiency. Um, we're, we're very energy intensive and every um, BTU of energy that we don't use is, is dollars to our bottom line. And so they set the goal and, and we didn't have a road map on how to get there. We, we, we couldn't just pull a book out and say let's get it done. Our engineers and our scientists had to go innovate within our own facilities um, to make those improvements happen. So it was, the bottom line was what was driving us, and then you had this, this unintended consequence, which was a good consequence, with the environmental benefits that came with it. I, targets have a place in this, and, that, and I just gave you an example. We had, we had targets, we didn't have a road map to get there, we got there. Um, so yes, it's a balance though. If you put the targets too high, um, and, and your technology doesn't allow you to get there, and I'm talking specifically about um, CO2 reductions, then the only other tool we have to get those targets is to reduce the economic output because of the relationship between energy, CO2, and, and growth of our economy. And, and so we have to have the targets that, that, that find those things that we can do today, energy efficiency. Um, but if we set them too high, and we make them binding, then we get ourselves into, the, the, again, environment versus economics, and, and no politician wants to make that decision, right? Uh, and so, so what I'm saying is targets have a place, they have to be understood, they have to be set, but alone they can't get us there, okay? We have to develop technology. We've got to get incentives in place to get the technology, because we're looking for a reduction of 80% by the year 2050. We can't just set that 80%, that's an example. We'll never get there um, in an economically effective way. So targets, yes, but you have to go much farther than that and, and uncover the technologies, find the incentives that allow us to uh, uncover those technologies that can truly 
get us an energy breakthrough or get us a series of energy breakthroughs that we need to achieve that level of production.